Well, hello, everyone. We will wait a few seconds for people to join, and uh, we will begin the webinar in about 15 seconds. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Relapse or Resilience, Healthy Community Design, the fifth session of this year's Smart Growth Summit presented by the Center for Planning Excellence in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My name is George Bell and I will be moderating today's session. Just by way of introduction, I am uh, the current president and CEO of Capital Area United Way, but I also serve, serve on the CPAC, CPAC's board and uh, have been uh, uh, on that board for several years. Uh, prior to taking over the role as CEO of Capital Area United Way, uh, I worked, had a 30 year career in uh, uh, healthcare, uh, executive healthcare. And uh, I uh, finished my career in healthcare at Baton Rouge General, uh, where I uh, uh, retired as the uh, administrator of uh, the Baton Rouge General Mid City Campus. So, this is a topic that is near and dear to me. Um, however, before we begin, CPEX would like to thank today's session sponsor, Aetna Better Health of Louisiana. We'd also like to acknowledge all of our sponsors, including our platinum sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, Greater New Orleans Foundation, Power Coalition for Equity and Justice, and 89.3 WRKF, and our gold sponsors, American Planning Association, Louisiana Chapter, LSU Ag Center, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, now, closed captioning uh, is provided by AARP Louisiana. A few housekeeping items to address before we get started. Today's session has been pre approved for continuing education for certified planners, certified floodplain managers, and continuing legal education or CLE credits. To receive CLE or CFM credit, participants must respond to each of the three polling questions that will be asked throughout the session and submit information in the exit survey at the end of the session. Realtors, architects, and landscape architects may self-report credit. Please visit the continuing education tab at our website, summit.cpex.org for more information. You may turn on closed captioning using the button at the bottom of your screen. We're reserving the final portion of this session for a panel discussion, including questions from you, our viewers. So please enter your questions into the Q&A using the button at the bottom of your screen. And finally, we are recording this session and all registrants will receive an email with the video link after the session. All right. Well, this year's virtual Smart Growth Summit is focused on three big themes, climate change, COVID-19 and equity. And as you may have observed over the last several months of, of election um, politics, those three themes have been uh, front and center as far as the, their importance and, and the way the, the, these themes have shaped the, uh, the election, uh, this year's elections. Uh, previous summit sessions have explored how cities are adapting their businesses and transportation systems to COVID restrictions. The role black owned businesses play in healthy thriving communities. During the summit's climate week, we heard the climate change 
We heard what climate change has in store for Louisiana and what we need to be, or what we need to do to mitigate and adapt equitably. We're very pleased to be continuing the conversation this week with Relapse or Resilience, Healthy Community Design. In recent years, the idea of social determinants of health has gained a lot of traction and, uh, and understanding that many of the factors that determine how healthy we are, are found in our environment, in our neighborhood context, not at the clinic or the doctor's office or even the hospital. The quality of the air we breathe, our access to transportation and economic opportunity, our ability to safely walk, ride, or socialize in public spaces, our exposure to climate hazards such as extreme heat or flooding, all of these things profoundly affect our health. And all of these things are profoundly affected by planning, the way we design communities and the policies and systems that influence and guide development. Now, and now, is one of those moments in and now is one of those moments in history as we sit at the intersection of growing climate change impacts the ravages of the covid-19 pandemic and social unrest generated by ongoing racial disparities that is exposing the many ways in which the conditions of the specific place we live so deeply affects our ability to maintain physical and mental health our speakers today are going to elaborate on the connections between planning and public health, approaches that can set a new bar for addressing public health through planning and development, and the systems and policies that need to be reevaluated and changed to support development of equitable, healthy communities. We also look forward to hearing from those of you in attendance and discussing your questions concerns and ideas related to these issues. Now, let me introduce this distinguished panel of speakers. First on the list is Calvin Gladney. Mr. Gladney is president and CEO of Smart Growth America, SGA and has led community revitalization efforts in dozens of communities around the country as a private consultant, a real estate developer, and as a government official. His work over the last 15 years has been centered on the intersection of land use, transportation, and economic development, all of which will be important in addressing our climate crisis and our longstanding racial equity issues. Next up is Christopher Tyson. Chris is president and CEO of Build Baton Rouge, which works in, to bring people and resources together to promote equity, equitable investment, innovative development, and thriving communities across all of Baton Rouge. He is on leave from his position as a law professor at LSU Law Center. His training in architecture, public policy, and real estate law all influence his leadership in addressing disinvested neighborhoods in Baton Rouge and promoting the cause of equitable development in the capital city and beyond. And then there's Jessica McKelvey Kemp. Jessica is vice president of the Center for Planning Excellence, where she focuses on the connections between planning, public, public health, and healthy community design. She is a lifelong fellow of the Effective Leadership Program, a joint endeavor of Duke University, Southern University, and the University of Cape Town to cultivate, to cultivate leaders committed to social justice in Louisiana and South Africa. So before Jessica begins, we have our first poll question covering this topic. So that question is, 
Which of the following is a social determinant of health? Okay, now we'll turn it over to Jessica, who will start us off. Thank you, George. And um, I believe we were supposed to uh, see the poll results, but, um, oh, here we go. Wow, great job, guys. Um, I'm glad we're, we're starting off ahead of the game here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and trying to navigate all the screens here. Um, share my screen. Okay, and there's a sneak peek there. Okay, I think I'm set. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience. Thank you, George, for the great introduction. Um, I'm really glad to be here and take a little break from watching election news. So I believe the things we are going to talk about today are also things that we should be lifting up to our local and national leadership to help drive the systemic changes that are needed to give every American an opportunity to live in a community that supports their health and well-being. Oh. Okay, there we go. Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with the Center for Planning Excellence. We are a statewide nonprofit planning organization based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We work with state and local governments, communities and neighborhoods and philanthropic nonprofit and private sector partners to advance smart growth and healthy community design, climate change adaptation and equitable development and community engagement. Over the past several years, CPEX has been increasing our focus on how our built environment which is largely shaped by planning decisions and regulations or lack thereof, affects public health and many of the social determinants of health and how we can address many of our top public health concerns through healthy community design and better planning. So as the coronavirus has, pandemic has progressed, we are seeing even more ways that community design impacts a person's ability to be well and resilient their ability to stay healthy, avoid spreading the illness, and manage closures and economic disruptions. And as we've discussed in earlier Smart Growth Summit sessions, we're increasingly seeing the health impacts of climate change, which are also driven by, excuse me, which is also driven by our land use patterns and the way we develop, and how low wealth communities and communities of color are bearing the brunt of those impacts. And another critical aspect of this particular moment in history is the growing energy around racial justice, spurred in part by people's need to feel and be safe in the places they live, work, and play. Even the threat of violence and discrimination impacts health, causing dangerous stress levels and potentially restricting activity. So as George mentioned, these major issues are converging in this moment, public health, climate change, equity, and it is potentially a transformative moment, an opportunity to upend the status quo and reform our systems and practices to address these major threats to our collective well being. But it will only be transformative if we make it so, if we sustain the momentum that is building and advocate for and implement new approaches to shaping and protecting our shared environment, our built environment, our natural environment, and our policy environment. So as you can see from this slide here, um, some of the ways that cities, business owners, healthcare providers, and residents have responded to the pandemic prove that transformation is possible. And furthermore, that we are capable of doing it quickly. We've seen cities transform car lanes into bike lanes. We've seen restaurants move their business outdoors using spaces previously dedicated to cars. We've seen COVID testing services go mobile to reach those who don't have access to transportation, as you can see in the mobile testing unit pictured at the bottom of the slide. And we've seen residents take to walking and biking like never before. So we are capable of transformative change. And these changes have been positive, allowing people to get more exercise, to socialize more safely in outdoor areas, to access healthcare services, 
and air quality has improved in many places as well as a result of having fewer cars on the road. But before I get ahead of myself, I want to take a minute to reiterate why this is so important. Most of you are probably familiar with the social determinants of health. You guys nailed it on the quiz, um, but I, I'm gonna go over it anyway. It's defined as, by the CDC as the conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. Most researchers agree that about 80% of health outcomes are driven by these social determinants of health. So for most people, what happens outside of the doctor's office or clinical setting is much more consequential to their health than what happens within those offices. The CDC categorizes social determinants of health into five key areas healthcare access and quality, education access and quality, social and community context, economic stability, and neighborhood and built environment. I want to point out that even though neighborhood and built environment is only one category, every other category is directly connected to the place you live and the resources and opportunities you have access to within your community. And this is why it is so critical that we are designing and retrofitting and revitalizing communities and the systems that support and connect those communities to support health. So how do we do that? We have to recognize and prioritize healthy community design. This means ensuring that the places we live have clean air and water, that green space and tree canopy provide relief from heat island effects, purify the air, offer outdoor spaces that enhance mental health and encourage socialization. We need sidewalks, bike lanes, and quality transit that offer transportation options that are active, affordable, and safe. It means having housing stock that is affordable and climate resilient and not segregating low-income households. And it means creating 20 minute neighborhoods where everything a person needs on a daily basis is available via a safe walk, bike or transit ride that takes no more than 20 minutes. At a systems and institutional level, we need to reconnect planning and public health. As you can see from the overview on the slide, planning and public health were once closely connected in their shared mission to cut excuse me, to combat the spread of infectious diseases within crowded and often unsanitary urban environments. Around the middle of the 20th century, planning began to focus more on segregated zoning and suburbanization, which have contributed to many of the health and equity issues we're grappling with today. So now we need to reconnect the two disciplines so that we can work together to address climate change, public health, and growing racial and economic disparities. This is underway. Some places are much further along than others. Uh, we still have a long way to go. The way we've designed our neighborhoods, cities, and regions over the past several decades has been a driver of many of the health issues that are affecting large portions of our population today, increasing obesity, heart disease, certain types of cancer, and mental health issues. This also means new partnerships and new messengers are, are needed. Planners, designers, engineers, and others who influence the built environment need to be working hand in hand with physicians, hospitals, insurers, community clinics, researchers, and other players in the healthcare field to co-develop strategies to address our greatest public health challenges. If the places we live are driving 80% of our health outcomes, then we cannot expect to make transformative changes unless we work together. I want to spend the last few minutes of my presentation talking about a couple of the projects that CPEX has done seeking to build the partnerships and knowledge needed to move these efforts forward. The first one I wanna talk about started several years ago. CPEX worked with AARP and a community-based advocacy group, the Baton Rouge Sustainable Transportation Action Committee to pilot a data-driven collaborative approach to improving transportation infrastructure in one of Baton Rouge's most heavily used corridors. Two things were unprecedented about this pilot. First, the data. Using publicly available data, we created a map of the corridor that showed transit usage, crash incidents, bike and pedestrian injuries, and fatalities and other traffic-related data. We then layered on census data for race, age, and income, and health data from the CDC 500 cities data sets, which allowed us to look at the census block level, obesity, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and more. 
What resulted was a map that led us to hotspots where multiple needs converged, mobility needs, health needs, safety needs, and pointed us towards the interventions that would deliver the greatest benefit across a number of indicators from active transportation to accessing jobs and education, access to healthy food and health care, ability to increase physical activity and others. The second breakthrough for this pilot project was the partnership. From the outset, we had our community stakeholders at the table with DOTD, the city's transportation manager and staff, public health experts from the LSU School of Medicine, city council members representing the districts traversed by the corridor, and the mayor's office and her healthy BR staff. It was incredible to hear the conversations that took place at those meetings. We heard over and over again how transportation development had never been done this way before, how much insight, knowledge, and perspective was gained from this collaborative approach. It resulted in identifying, prioritizing a number of infrastructure projects that we could feel confident represented the best use of limited public funds. The second pilot project that I want to mention is one we are, that is currently underway um, and we are very excited about it. CPEX is partnering with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana's advanced data and analytics team. We're conducting a detailed place-based analysis of a sample of complete streets infrastructure, parks, and green spaces in East Baton Rouge Parish to learn more about how these types of amenities in the built environment impact the health of nearby residents over time and what specific features and conditions are associated with the greatest health benefits. Moreover, we are seeking to discern how the same intervention, a similar park or bike path, may perform differently in different neighborhood contexts. Here, we're looking primarily at demographic differences. As far as we know, the study is unprecedented and we are very excited about the capacity this could build, the ability to evaluate the performance and health impacts of different features of the built environment within very specific contexts and use that information to guide investment of our limited public dollars into projects and interventions that will deliver the greatest public good. We're also excited about building this partnership with a major insurer that's invested in community well-being and adding others from the both the beginning, excuse me, adding others from both the planning and development side, the healthcare sector, and research institutions to this partnership as we expand the scope of the pilot. Uh, I stumbled there because I'm getting my time's up signal. So um, perfect timing. Um, I, I want to stop there and give my fellow panelists their chance to talk about the great work they are doing and the opportunities they see for transforming our communities, systems, and policies to support healthy community design and a healthy population. Quickly though, uh, we'll do our second poll question. And we'll give everyone just a minute to finish the poll question. And while we're waiting for the results to come up, um, Chris, if you want to join us. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Chris um, and not hold us up waiting on the, oh, here we are. Um, Okay, great. Again, um, you all are you all are doing fantastic on the polls. Chris, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Let me get my uh, screen up. I'm trying to get mine off. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's see. Can you all see that? All right, I'll go ahead and uh, get started. I'm Chris Tyson with uh, Bill Baton Rouge. We are the Redevelopment Authority for East Baton Rouge Parish. And um, I, I'm gonna talk to you about a project we've been working on that I think captures uh, some of our ambitions for healthy community design and, and ways to think about uh, the social determinants of health uh, in an actual project that's underway here in, in Baton Rouge. And so um, uh, we are, um, let me see if my, there we go. Um, 
So, so I, I want to share with you a project that we've been working on for the last three years on one of Baton Rouge's most uh, distressed and disinvested urban corridors, Plank Road. Uh, and we began the Plank Road Master Plan in 2018 as a transit-oriented, uh, equitable uh, redevelopment vision that we continue to uh, work as we are in the implementation phase now. Uh, and I want to share some of those aspects with you as they relate to our conversation about healthy community design. Uh, imagine Plank Road is our tagline. If you go on social media and hashtag Imagine Plank Road, you can kind of chronicle the work that we've done on this project. Uh, but it really has been a process of bringing people together around a vision, a process, and an implementable plan for equitable uh, development. Now, Plank Road runs through the heart of North Baton Rouge, and Baton Rouge in many ways has become a tale of two cities with the best and worst fortunes of life in Louisiana captured on either side of Baton Rouge's uh, divide. Uh, Plank Road uh, has, has a history that stretches back into the 19th century as an early route for the transport of enslaved persons and goods from the plantations north of the city to uh, the river docks in, in downtown. Uh, when Standard Oil, the forerunner to Exxon, came to Baton Rouge in 1909, Plank Road became uh, overnight a commercial corridor that supported the neighborhoods uh, that were uh, built for the white working class workers of, of the Exxon plant in its early days. Uh, this is a picture ca captured from the 1930s uh, that uh, kind of shows you the land use character of early Plank Road with buildings built to the street, uh, walkability, a uh, fair amount of, of density uh, relative to uh, the uh, uh, low density character of, of uh, early 20th century Baton Rouge. But it was built as a traditional commercial corridor that developed alongside the automobile uh, and public transportation in ways that um, we celebrate now as we look to corridors that are organized later in the, in the 20th century uh, around the automobile uh, racial segregation uh, and, and, and residential exclusivity. So this is Plank Road at its beginnings, and I, I want you to remember this corner because we're going to talk about this particular um, uh, location in our revitalization plans. Uh, this is what Plank Road looks like today. It is severely blighted. Uh, it has uh, crumbling infrastructure. It has significant blight and vacancy uh, dilapidation. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, still communities uh, and neighbors and businesses that live there that consider this home. Uh, it has the second highest transit ridership in the city parish. It also unfortunately has one of the highest uh, levels of pedestrian and vehicular accidents in the region. Um, it has uh, one of the lowest levels of internet access and it has one of the highest levels of concentrated poverty in the state of Louisiana. And so uh, it was understandable that we turned our focus to Plank Road as an, uh, as an anchor for North Baton Rouge, but also as a way for us to understand uh, how to think about land use healthy community design, uh, uh, social equity, uh, and, and resilient uh, design uh, in one project. Uh, and so we developed the Plank Road uh, master plan and our vision was a thriving, socially diverse and walkable network of neighborhoods uh, anchored by strong local businesses, quality housing, and resilient infrastructure. And, and at, key to that was uh, a, a very robust uh, community engagement process that uh, drew uh, residents not only from the Plank Road corridor but throughout the, the, the area uh, into uh, experiential events uh, where we were able to listen uh, and learn and understand the community's ambitions for a revitalized Plank Road. Um, uh, out of that, several themes and priorities were, were developed, preserving culture, attracting businesses, tackling blight, introducing quality shopping, and, and providing more accessible uh, and attractive places to gather and recreate. And much of that uh, matches with what we think about. We think about healthy community design, uh, that we are transit-oriented in our development, focusing on mobility, lessening our reliance on cars and also creating opportunities for walkability and multimodal transportation, that we focus on open space, places to relax uh, 
and to congregate, that aren't privatized, uh, that are public uh, and create public goods and public amenities and opportunities for um, uh, uh, people to gather and to express culture and to share in community. Uh, grocery anchored, and we're gonna focus on this uh, because food is such an important aspect, not only of culture, but of local economies, of, of land use, uh, revitalization. We've talked a lot in this process about food and so a grocery anchored mixed use development and a community kitchen and food incubator were two of the primary projects that kind of you know bubbled to the surface of what people wanted to see in, um, in this project. And also recognizing that healthy design attributes exist in this neighborhood. A lot of walking, a lot of biking, uh, but we wanted to understand how those relate to uh, the ways that community members lived their lives and what their specific needs were. And that's important because uh, there are many aspects of healthy community design and we want to lead with those that are most responsive to what community members themselves identify as priorities for their communities. Uh, we've had progress with this plan. It has been adopted by the Metropolitan Council, ensuring that uh, the political apparatus here in Baton Rouge will be accountable to these plans over the long term. Uh, we have secured funding from a variety of sources, including a recent award from the J.P. Morgan Chase Advancing Cities uh, Program, our community kitchen, food incubator, community land trust. Uh, the planning for all of that is underway in overlay district uh, that will enforce a uh, higher quality of place is underway and we continue to build partnerships with new businesses uh, and for new funding. Uh, here are two of the projects underway, uh, a mixed use development in the top right hand corner that will feature a new daycare center, new office space and affordable housing uh, and also a new community park uh, that we're doing in, in conjunction with our recreation system here in, in, in Baton Rouge and also uh, being led by students at LSU's uh, School of Landscape Architecture who are thinking about uh, how to revive a vacant uh, uh, blighted lot and turn it on a busy urban corridor and turn it into a place of, of recreation, relaxation and cultural celebration. Uh, you see from the building we are uh, built to the street emphasizing walkability uh, and the streetscape uh, having verticality and creating spaces that um, uh, are more livable uh, and more in tune with uh, how uh, people live their lives in the community. Um, the food hub, uh, where we talked about grocery stores and a food uh, incubator and community kitchen, uh, was a central part of what we got out of this planning effort. And so plans are underway for a food hub uh, on a collection of, of vacant lots that uh, are held in Build Baton Rouge's land bank in addition to the redevelopment authority. We are also the land bank for East Baton Rouge Parish. We have a <clears throat> excuse me, a hybrid uh, re uh, redevelopment authority and, and land bank. And so we're able to not only think about how to plan for equitable development, but actually leverage vacant and blighted property uh, adjudicated on the city's tax rolls in conjunction with the Metropolitan Council and the mayor's office to, to see to it that those lots are uh, identified for catalytic development. And we've assembled uh, a number of lots that will support uh, this food hub. And so again, it's, it's a grocery anchored mixed use development on uh, the transit line. I should mention that uh, Baton Rouge's uh, and Louisiana's first bus rapid transit system will roll through Plank Road uh, as part of the Plank Road master plan. So we're excited that BRT is going to be coming and much of the development that we're talking about will be directly on the BRT line. Uh, having housing in close proximity to where the grocery store is, the community kitchen and food incubator, thinking about how to create rentable commercial kitchen space and meeting spaces that not only allow for our, our nearby uh, urban farms to have a place to uh, do farm to table or do uh, 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 community markets uh, activity, but also to have a place where uh, local culinary businesses, mom and pop caterers and food trucks, many of whom are operating out of their kitchens, have a commercial space that is affordable, accessible, and allows them to scale their businesses. That was something that uh, got a lot of traction in our planning effort, and we're uh, working now to, to bring to fruition. And, and I mentioned supporting local urban farms. Um, 
the rendering at the bottom uh, right hand corner uh, of the screen is uh, a revision of the image that you see at the top left hand corner. Uh, and so uh, this is where we see, uh, we have plans for this food hub to happen. And so we have a density coming here. We have uh, accessibility to transit assets. We have uh, walkable uh, streetscapes that uh, cater to a variety of, of mobility uh, modes. And so we have um, uh, design that um, uh, I think celebrates and creates a sense of place, a destination, a sense of pride uh, and um, uh, quality of place. Uh, and uh, uh, we do that by, by mixing into the existing fabric so that people who live a block uh, or so off of this corridor uh, can walk to these amenities and have them directly in uh, their neighborhoods. Just giving you a, a bit of a vision of what we're pursuing uh, in this area. Um, uh, what are some of the challenges to uh, achieving this? Uh, what we are talking about, and we are very thankful to our um, uh, uh, supporters, our, our philanthropic donors, and, and other investors in this vision, uh, and we look forward to uh, expanding that circle. Uh, but we're talking about something that is not presently occurring, and so a, a significant amount of capital, uh, much of it public capital, nonprofit capital, mission-driven capital, has has to be brought to bear in order to uh, set in motion this type of catalytic development. And so when we think about challenges and barriers, we think about uh, securing uh, in, uh, the incentives and supports, aligning the various public finance uh, uh, tools that all have uh, varying requirements and timelines and bureaucratic processes that have to be managed. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of energy, a lot of partnership uh, to bring that about and any effort to streamline that uh, inures to the benefit of equitable uh, development and sustainable and healthy community design uh, because a significant amount of cost and time is spent uh, pulling together these various resources. Also, there is a challenge of building community capacity uh, so that community members themselves have opportunities for entrepreneurship, leadership development, uh, and uh, that they have the ability to be centered in this work. Uh, and that also requires resources uh, and, and capacity building and investing in uh, the people who live in these neighborhoods. You can't just swoop in and, and, and drop these assets uh, and expect them to, to work. There has to be a significant amount of buy-in, uh, but there also has to be opportunities for the people who live there to improve their lives, to improve their station, and to actually have hands-on uh, 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 skills building interaction with uh, these types of processes. Uh, and, and again, navigating the various regulatory requirements necessary to conduct food-related enterprises. This is obviously a heavily regulated area. And so uh, being able to manage uh, interaction with a host of uh, regulatory agencies and actors is important to efficiently uh, moving through these processes. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, before we go into uh, with the next uh, presentation and the discussion, I just wanted to highlight a few things that I think are not only important for um, uh, healthy community design, but equitable development, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, we must have a nuanced and unvarnished understanding of local history. Uh, the communities that we go into that are disinvested, that suffer from cycles of scarcity and deprivation uh, are not natural conditions. They are not pre-political or pre-historical. Uh, they are the result of specific choices and policy decisions that have existed for a long period of time and understanding those resource maldistributions and those intentional uh, 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 the developments that created disparities is vitally important to understanding how to uh, revitalize those areas and, and create something different. Confronting how race has historically and continues to shape urban development is key. We have to be honest about that and unapologetic in talking about race, uh, not just as a historical artifact, but something that has cumulative intergenerational impact. It continues, uh, gaps naturally widen, they don't close unless there is some significant disruption. We have to be honest about that uh, and unrelenting in addressing that. We have to have authentic and ongoing community engagement 
engagement. Uh, this is about people and people's lives. Uh, they live there. This is their community. Uh, if you are coming uh, with all the best intentions, uh, you must uh, center them and their ambitions and listen to them uh, as you do your work. And that is the only way to do uh, meaningful and worthwhile work. And lastly, uh, that resources for neighborhood planning efforts must be spent uh, on the businesses and services of the people who live there. Uh, we should not guinea pig these communities when we uh, do this type of work. Uh, that when where there are opportunities to employ and to partner with existing community assets and resources in ways that uh, redistributes resources and, and, and wealth, uh, we should uh, jump at the opportunity to do that. So uh, I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. I'm gonna get off screen share uh, and uh, move on to, I believe, uh, Calvin is next. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that, that moves right into what I wanted to talk about, particularly, as you said, being unapologetic about talking about race, which I am gonna do. So I hope everyone's ready. Um, as George said earlier, my name's Calvin Gladney. Um, I am president and CEO of Smart Growth America. And just in case you're kind of social media folks, you can hit us all up at, at Smart Growth CEO and we can have this conversation in multiple places. Um, wanted to talk today about healthy community design. And wanted to make sure though, before we even get there, uh oh, sorry. Technical difficulties, what's going on? There we go. Um, just wanna make sure folks um, knew about Smart Growth America. We're a national nonprofit. We're a, a, a super friend of CPEX uh, and Build Baton Rouge. Um, and our North Star is created in a country where no matter where you live or who you are, you can enjoy living in a place that's healthy, that's prosperous and resilient. And so this idea of shared prosperity, a resilient community, obviously totally aligns with talking about healthy community uh, design. And so that's what I wanna do today. So as opposed to only talking about SGA, I kinda wanted to talk about a bug. That's a bug. Actually, you know what, Let's we're gonna get back to this point. Um, healthy community design. It's an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary idea when you think about how to design a healthy community. You can see that in what Jessica talked about in terms of planning. You can see that in what Chris talked about, even as you looked at what were just sort of standalone projects. They still had interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary issues to them. And so I just wanted to sort of run through how a lot of these interdisciplinary issues not only need to be thought about together to get the healthy community design, but also, as Chris um, said earlier, race has to be sort of centered, racial equity centered, and actually thought about first and foremost as you're thinking about what are the right interventions, what are the right investments, and what are the right things you're going to do. And so you're looking at a picture here of a uh, a guy walking across the street. And you can see right off the bat that it's a very, it's an arterial. Um, this is a little bit wider than Plank Road, but it's also a very dangerous look. You can see just in terms of cars. And we just released a study uh, just the other day called, I'm having trouble with my, uh, Sorry, my screen is moving slowly. We just released a report called Driving Down Emissions just the other day, which really got to this question of community design when it looks at um, roads and roadways. And one of the things that we, we saw and one of the things we learned from our analysis is that the faster the roadway design, the sort of stated maximum speed on that highway, the higher the fatality rate and the lower the rate that people could survive the collisions. And you can see that the, the, the numbers dramatically increase when you go from a 20 mile per hour street to a 30, hour, 30, 30 mile per hour street, a 40%, you know, it goes up to 45% in, 
the likelihood of a fatality. So this, this idea of healthy community design isn't just the neighborhood, it really is the supporting infrastructure in the neighborhood and actually street design is a part of that. Uh, and when you think about street design, we also have a report that we call Dangerous by Design. Our next one will come out actually in January because of the data. And that Dangerous by Design report showed that this is where this question of race comes in and we have to, as Chris said, be upfront in talking about race in terms of these issues. Not only does there is an issue of pedestrian danger when you just look at the design of streets, we find that disproportionately fatal crashes inure to the detriment of people of color and indigenous peoples. So it's not just thinking about healthy community design and saying, what's the right technical idea from a regular street design standpoint, but also even looking more closely in black and brown and indigenous communities and saying, let's look at their design because right now, based on history and, and purpose, the design of those streets are leading to even more fatal crashes. But it goes beyond just street design. It also goes to how we invest our overall transportation infrastructure and looking at something like highways. This is a picture of the Overton neighborhood in Miami, Florida. I don't know if anybody here is from Florida, but Overton was essentially like the Harlem Jazz District of the South. It was a place you know, of vibrancy, energy, successful black uh, and brown businesses. And the highway project in Overton, as you can see from this visual, ran through the neighborhood, decimated the neighborhood, and it has never come back. Um, this is not, I could show you 15 slides like this. Um, so this is not just a function of Miami. You can find it in Louisiana, obviously. This is a picture of, picture of Austin, Texas, where the I-35 um, came through and split up neighborhoods. And I saw Ralph Ibarra was, is in the meeting somewhere. And even in Seattle, you can find that many of the, you know, the I-10 and others split through neighborhoods in Seattle. So these investments of highway infrastructure often have become a detriment to healthy community design. So we can't just think about the community itself. We have to think about the highway infrastructure, these transportation system investments and how they are either contributing to or a detriment to healthy community design. I don't know if anybody recognizes this visual, but this is the ninth ward in Louisiana. And as you can see, this is a picture about land use and housing and where people are allowed to live. Um, it's also a picture about infrastructure. You can see these, these houses backing up to a levee and there were decisions made about investments in that levy and who actually had to end up living next to it. And one of the things you know is that, and, and Chris, Chris referenced this, there has been a history of redlining and an allowance of where people were allowed to live could get the financing, the backing to live in certain neighborhoods. And it's no accident that certain people had to live in certain neighborhoods. and Unfortunately, as a result, and this is a picture of that same Ninth Ward neighborhood during Hurricane Katrina, when you have a certain set of land use decisions and infrastructure decisions that are made in ways that are detrimental to folks of certain races to black and brown communities, land use and zoning and infrastructure all contribute to what ends up, as you can see, this is clearly not, this clearly couldn't have been a resilient Healthy, healthily designed community if this is the result from something like Hurricane Katrina. So I talked earlier about a bug, and this is when you really think about the question of systems level change and whether, how is the system being designed? And what I'm here to tell you today is that our system, our system of infrastructure investment, our system of transportation investments, pedestrian investments, mobility investments, land use, zoning. This system is not broken. This system doesn't have a bug in it. This system has been designed over the course of history to churn out racially based disparities. And so when we look at the social determinants of health, when we look at health disparities and see food deserts where we need to solve that food desert with a, with a food hub, that 
those systemic problems, those challenges, those challenges um, to the social determinants of health, those are not bugs in the system. Those are a feature of the system. And so we just have to be clear of that, that we have to fight not just at the local level, we have to think on the systems level, change level, because transactions, individual projects alone won't solve the problem because the entire, entire system has been designed ultimately to, to benefit a certain class and race of people, um, whether by design or by output. And so we have to understand that if these challenges, these disparities, these health disparities are not a bug, but a feature of the system, that means we have to change the system to get there. And the question is, how do we do that? And this is a cycle, right? So as Jessica said in the very beginning, there's sort of an intersection of public health, race, and equity. And I think George talked about that as well. But as even, it's just not as broad as public health. It even gets narrower when you think about COVID-19. And you can see this intersectionality. I wanted to talk quickly about that and then give us some stuff that we can do. So the CDC put out a study that said that minorities experience higher exposure to traffic-related air pollution. And this is a result of that same multidisciplinary into disciplinary results and disparities based on race. Because if you think about it, what communities are cited under the highway, next to the highway, the highway splits it, major arterial, state roads, federal highways go through neighborhoods. These are the neighborhoods where black and brown communities were either forced to be or had no choice and no other options but to be there. And so we experience more traffic related air pollution. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means more than we can just not breathe. It actually means that when it comes to COVID, it reduces our survival rate. This was a study that came out um, from Harvard um, actually just this spring and showed that the survival rates of individuals with COVID-19 go down based on their exposure to pollution. So if you think about all of the disparities you've heard in terms of infection, hospitalization, and death rates um, on COVID-19 in the comparison between black and brown communities and other communities, you can see why this is happening. It goes back to our built environment. It goes back to unhealthy community design, not just the individual decisions of people. So finally, what can we do? I'm gonna leave you with three things. The first is to center equity in everything you do. And one way to do that, to be clear, is to create metrics. You wanna work backwards from racial equity metrics. So you could, as the, um, the stat um, example showed, think about the social determinants of health, do a zip code census tract basis analysis of the social determinants of health in your area, come up with equity matrix metrics that would close those gaps. And then you can assess each of these multi-modalities. You can assess each of these investments, each of these infrastructure decisions. You can assess them based on actual metrics. And then you can see what happens when you make the different investments on those social determinants of health. That's one. Two is you really have to think about how did we get here? This is a picture, a picture from Seattle where you know, what we did locally there was, well, we could paint, you know, try to beautify. This is a beautification project under the highway. But the problem is that the fact that the highway came here and ruined this community to begin with. So what I wanna say as a second thing is that we have to fight upstream. We have to do, do some things at the federal level. There needs to be federal advocacy. And even if you're a local or state or regional player, you need to find national partners you can partner with or gather best practices so that you can advocate at the federal level. And I won't go into too, too many details, but I would say the biggest thing in thinking about transportation is transportation parity, as we call it. And this is the parity of how things are funded. One of the reasons why you see a lot of highway projects go forward, but not public transit projects, is the disparity between how these things are funded. And right now, 80 to 90% of any highway project is funded by the federal share but only 50% of public transit is. And if you're thinking about doing more pedestrian improvements and other types of multi-modalities, the federal government says, oh, that's discretionary locally. And so what happens is you get a bias towards highway and these projects that are, the, are one of the main reasons we have bad community design. 
Finally, I'll end with the picture I started with. And I don't know if anybody here is from the Ohio area, but this is a picture of the great Cuyahoga River fire in Cleveland um, back in 1969. And one of the things that happened after that fire is folks started federal advocacy and thought big. And I wanna push you to think big. These are all the federal agencies and laws that came out of that very one fire. People said, you know what? We can't make decisions just locally alone. We need to think on a legislative policy level. And they went and fought and became advocates and created big legislative wins. So I wanna implore you today to think big and when you think big, it reminds me of that saying by Daniel Burnham, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir the blood. Um, so I want you to dream with me. I want you to fight upstream. I want you to have race centered in everything you think and you do. Um, and hopefully too, you can come dream big, uh, big with us as well. In January, we're gonna have a racial equity focused summit that'll talk about a lot of these issues. So hit me up on social media. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all that you are doing. Um, and I know we'll see each other hopefully soon. All right. Well, Calvin, thank you so much. And, and to all our speakers, really, uh, thank you for being with us today. We'll get into our discussion and we'll uh, incorporate questions from the audience as we talk. So attendees, please submit your questions into the Q&A using the button at the bottom of your screen. But before we get started, let's see the results of our last poll question. All right, looks like we got that one. All right, well, while we were waiting for questions from the audience, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna start off the Q&A with a couple of questions of my own. Uh, let's pick up where the last poll question left off and talk about policy. What policy shifts are needed to avoid ongoing disinvestment that ultimately results in health and wealth disparities and the need for these kinds of projects and fixes. So I will, uh, I'll leave this one uh, to uh, Calvin first. I'll, I'll start with Calvin and then uh, I definitely wanna hear from you, Chris, as well. Um, why don't you say the question again, just to- Sure thing. All right, what policy, policy shifts are needed to avoid ongoing disinvestment that ultimately results in health and wealth disparities and the need for these kinds of projects and fixes? You know, this is one that applies at every level and the policy um, imperative I would recommend is to embed equity metrics in the policy decision-making so that you must quantify and measure the social determinants of health as both a decision-making tool for these various decisions, as well as capturing the results. And that has to be a legislated decision so that funding approvals are only given to folks that actually create those metrics and then have a way to follow along and quantify them. The problem really is if, if you don't measure it, if you don't quantify it, if you don't track it, then ultimately you don't really mean it. And, and so that's what, I, that, to me, that's a, a global change that if we just did that alone, it would have so many domino effects. Yeah, so reframing the whole, uh, the whole way you look at these, these issues. Chris. So, so Calvin uh, is, is speaking to something that uh, uh, I've covered in, in my scholarship and a number of other scholars have covered in, uh, in under, the, under the term race audits uh, and really attaching uh, an audit mechanism to policy across uh, federal, state and local uh, to be able to track the true impact of uh, resource uh, allocation 
uh, in communities that have been historically disinvested uh, down to whether or not we are seeing um, a real change in both uh, health outcomes and quality of life outcomes, also in business starts and sustainability uh, and a host of other factors that we can actually measure if we calibrate the policy correctly. I think uh, one of the examples we see now is, is the Opportunity Zone legislation where we have no way to really understand how that capital is being deployed in service of equitable aims. Uh, and so that is something. And so we're, what we've seen, right, is, is that capital has flowed in a number of different uh, directions. Some of it uh, has gone to projects that are, are transformative and impactful into neighborhoods, but uh, much of it is going to places that would have likely attracted development without the incentive uh, and are areas that uh, are developing in ways that are, are furthering displacement uh, and marginalization without any local, federal, or, 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 or state checks and policy mm -hmm. on on, uh, you know, that, that would guard against anti-displacement um, uh, activity. So, uh, you know, I, I think at the core of it, uh, we can track this if we want to. We can measure this if we want to. We can embed in policy accountability measures that ensure that we can understand the true impact if we are concerned about turning the tide of the history uh, and, and the uh, legacies that we've, you know, all covered in our, our talks. And really, that's a nice segue to a question I have for uh, Jessica. You know, CPEX, I first became aware of CPEX when uh, uh, you guys were doing work in helping to shape the, the transit, um, uh, the, 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 how the use of the, the tax that was raised uh, and, and to get, build support for that. And, and I learned how important planning is and I learned how important it was to engage stakeholders in helping to um, drive the, the desired outcome that, that you were looking for. And, and tell me a little either about that example or other examples of how CPEX has played that role in communities uh, through their uh, work in planning uh, and, and advocacy. Sure, George, thank you. Um, I, you're right that CPEX has focused a lot on um, transit and complete streets. And I think um, an important part of the role that we have played is um, advocacy and providing um, local residents, community members who are interested in these issues with the, with the information and the tools that they need to really build their own leadership around um, around their interests so that they are empowered to, to advocate for those interests. That leadership at the community level, I think is really important. We also uh, work in the other direction with our grass tops leaders, our elected officials, our mayors, our, our legislators, because we need, we need their leadership as well. And I think that, and we, this continues to be something that, that we strive to do is to help them see how important it is that we are distributing resources equitably, that we are uh, improving quality of life in the places that need it most, and that we are using evidence-based strategies to, to make those changes. And so those changes are possible, they are needed. It is the right thing to do for the collective well-being of, of the city, the region, the state. Um, and so we, we are always engaged in um, in advocacy for for that kind of work in general, just investing equitably in infrastructure, creating these healthy communities. The leadership is such a it's such a big role, and it gets back to what Calvin uh, was saying too. Because the whole time you're talking, Calvin, I'm thinking teeth. Like the the policies need teeth because you know we have policies that have equ you know re equity recommendations and and preferences and everything, but and that and they're always pointed to when you know if anyone cries foul, but they don't have any teeth. Um, and so really connecting that accountability to funding is, is key. All right, thank you, Jessica. So here, here's another one. And, and with this, you know, we're coming uh, on the heels of uh, election and uh, in, in many communities, uh, they've, they've elected new officials. Here's one that uh, I'll offer to the panel. Uh, what can elected officials and heads of city and state DOTs do differently to achieve more health equity and economic inclusion? 
Chris, you want to take that one? Well, I, I think um, as, as everyone has said, uh, we are still over focused on automobile transport through cities uh, as opposed to uh, other modes. And so the entire financing apparatus of how we uh, build infrastructure is heavily weighted in that direction. And um, uh, I don't think anyone thinks that, you know, we're going to not have cars tomorrow. Uh, I have three <laughs> car seats in the back of mine. So, uh, you know, we understand that. But if we are serious uh, about, uh, particularly in dense urban areas, particularly in places where we have assets uh, and infrastructure that can benefit from other modes of transportation and uh, create a healthier community, then we have to have a policy shift and we have to have that uh, distribution of attention and resources on uh, transportation infrastructure shift more towards public transit uh, and other modes, um, uh, non-automobile modes of, of transportation. And that has to be reflected in state policy as well as federal policy, which is the tool for all infrastructure development and funding. Okay. And one thing I wanted to add to that is the idea that we have to think intersectionally when we think about these things. So you can't think about housing challenges and transportation challenges in silos. And I'm not saying Chris was doing that. Um, and one of the ways that we've been pushing, um, and I wrote an op-ed on this uh, a couple of months back, is the idea of not just assessing the affordability of housing or then separately assessing the affordability of transportation options, whether it's transit or not, but saying, so for example, HUD might say, well, housing is affordable if it's it's at a max of 30% of your area median income. But we think that the metric should be a housing plus transportation metric, or we would say H plus T, so that your housing plus transportation costs don't exceed 45% of, of your median income. And what that does is say, there are a lot of places in the country where housing is cheap, but by the time you have like, you know, Chris mentioned having three car seats, but a lot of people end up with three cars. And so now you got three cars, insurance, maintenance, parking, licensing, fees, and the like, all of that make your overall lifestyle unaffordable, even if the housing is affordable. Um, and so one of the things is thinking about all of these, if we really want to think about resiliency, part of the resiliency really gets to the wealth building aspects of the things that we invest in, but also not just wealth building, are things wealth extracting. And right now, mm -hmm. a lot of the way we design our communities and particularly in black, br black and brown communities are wealth extracting. And that's the problem. Yeah, T tell us a little more about that, Calvin, because that, that's, that's a, I, I've, my first time hearing that, that uh, point. So we just did an analysis of the low income housing tax credit program, LITEX as people say. Okay. And we, um, one of our smart growth criteria or ways of thinking is that housing needs to be what we would call location efficient. And so the question is, as Jessica mentioned the idea of a 20 minute neighborhood, we kind of, we push that and think of a 15 minute neighborhood. Can you walk, bike and roll to services, amenities, and um, jobs and public transit, can you get that in a 15 minute radius from wherever you live? And so mm -hmm. we looked at the LIHTC program and said, okay, where, is, where are low income housing tax credit projects being financed? And it turns out that they are disproportionately what we would call not location efficient, they are not near public transit. So we think about the affordability of housing but there was a study, and I'll try to see if I can pop this op-ed because I referenced it somewhere, that showed that Houston is actually less affordable than New York City once you marry housing plus transportation costs. Because you can go find a less expensive house in Houston, but your car-related costs, and this is not even including the indirect or direct social determinants of health as another cost, but mm -hmm. just the financial costs alone mm -hmm make Houston less affordable than New York City. So it's the idea of saying, let's think about these things on an intersectional basis. And if, you know, if you're a black and brown community member, and this, this is where they're all intersectional as well, and then I'll stop, this all relates to black and brown businesses. So we mm -hmm. all know entrepreneurially that minority businesses tend to fund themselves first 
from friends and family and their own personal source of capital. Well, if we have wealth extraction as the way of our structuring our you know, mobile, uh, mobility investments, so folks are living farther out and have to have multiple cars and spending this money, they have less money to put into these entrepreneurial endeavors. And so that's the whole cycle. So how do we, how do we make these investments in an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, intersectional way that's wealth building, not wealth extracting? If I could jump in for a second, George, just to follow what Cal is saying and, and kind of put a, a local, uh, you know, doing work in this community uh, gloss on it. Um, mm -hmm. He's exactly right. And I think that the language that Calvin is speaking is so we talk about how do we reach policymakers, it really is uh, equipping them with these discursive tools to really um, uh, think more broadly about how you solve these solutions, how you how you solve these problems and even uh, address them. You know, when we first started with the Plank Road uh, master plan project, we started working on bus rapid transit. Well, as the redevelopment authority guy who does not run the transit system, uh, I, I heard a lot from stakeholders in the community, from elected officials. Well, why does Chris care about, you know, the bus? Why is, isn't he supposed to be focused on redevelopment? Um, you know, that like was a real conversation I had to have for a solid year. <laughs> so, so, so these, and I, and I don't say that to poke fun at anyone, but I do say it to kind of illustrate uh, the ways in which we've been conditioned to think about uh, what is optimal in development, who should be concerned about what, and the extent to which we lack this, this intersectional lens uh, that, that Calvin is saying, that before we even land banked the first property, we were at the table with uh, the, the, the local transit uh, agency, uh, State Department of Transportation, uh, and, and the city's Department of Public Works, um, and CPEX was there with us, right, to talk about uh, this transit-oriented solution because we understood how transit funds can be leveraged for development, uh, mm -hmm. because we understood the essential nature of, of transit in this particular community. We understood that this uh, kind of traditional commercial corridor was best suited for uh, uh, transit enhancements uh, because of its inherent uh, land use uh, character. So, you know, we, we had to operate at those intersections, but that's not the way that I think a lot of other stakeholders are trained or conditioned to think and about. And the government isn't structured that way. There's yeah. all these yeah. separate departments. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will make a push for George as well. Health systems have to think the same way as well. This hospital building and set of buildings that are right in the middle, typically, whether you go to the Cleveland Clinic in parts of clear, you could pick a health system and they have to know that they're not just the building. They have this direct effect. And I know George knows this on the built environment. And so they have to think of themselves as I like to call it a community shareholder and not just in a housing way, but how are they gonna affect housing, transportation and the like. And I think Jessica had something to jump in on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll add to that too, but Jessica, go ahead. I, well, I just wanted to, um, there's such a contrast in, uh, between what Calvin described and what Chris described. And uh, Calvin, I love the idea of wealth, wealth extracting. Um, and when we think about the, the suburbanization and, and this development that just keeps sprawling further and further out and how now we're, we're finding that uh, poverty is being suburbanized. And so not only is it wealth extracting, it's also health extracting. Um, and here we have another example of how, you know, those who are already dealing with the most burdens get another layer of hardship as their health is negatively affected by, you know, sitting in a car for long commutes, not having, you know, living in, in a, not in a mixed use area, but something that's exclusively residential. Um, it, it just layers on the disadvantage. And then as, you know, Chris is describing what they're thinking about on Plank Road and you see it, there's so much synergy there um, that, that, transportation and the housing and the commerce and the the walkability like all of those things come together to create livability and and assets and so it's just it's it's very interesting to think about the sorts of assets that accumulate when you develop well smart um and and the kind of deficits that you can suffer from if, if you don't no excellent and and you guys it's it's amazing how how closely aligned we we are, uh, or 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 starting to uh, become in uh, looking in the way we view these challenges. 
Uh, and and to, to uh, Calvin's point, uh, government wasn't designed to, to work this way. It, you know, everybody's accustomed to silos and looking at it through the lens that they, uh, you know, the perspective that they come from. But, but the importance of being able to look across the entire spectrum of, 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 of issues and then uh, align the resources, or well, first identify the root causes of the, the challenges that we're facing as communities, and then work uh, collaboratively across all those disciplines to come to address those, those root causes. That, that really is, is what it's going to take. But that doesn't happen organically. That's the, the challenge. It doesn't just happen. You have, you have to be intentional about it. So uh, I appreciate your comments on that. Uh, let me get a few quick uh, questions here. So uh, there was a question here from Ralph. Uh, is Plank Road, is the Plank Road area a qualified opportunity zone? I think this was for Chris. Uh, much of our study area is in a qualified opportunity zone. I think there's maybe one portion of the study area that isn't, but uh, the bulk of it is. And then here's another uh, question uh, from Robin. Uh, will you please talk about how you assessed the desire and need for your food hub elements? Absolutely. So we had a very, uh, as I mentioned, robust and experientially based um, uh, uh, community engagement effort. We actually uh, had several food related events. We, we had an event where we uh, hosted a number of uh, food trucks that were uh, locally based, uh, neighborhood based uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we had uh, a, a street um, a fair. We, we, we had a number of, of uh, incidents and we also had more traditional um, uh, forums and, and uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, outreach events where we uh, kept hearing um, a, a desire to have support for food related businesses. Many of the entrepreneurs uh, in the area are, are food related entrepreneurs. They're small caterers, they're restaurateurs, they, they uh, have food trucks or other entities, uh, or they aspire uh, to those uh, fields. Food is very central to culture in, in black communities, but also it's central to uh, the economy. So uh, it was through those efforts that um, we arrived at the food incubator, understanding that there was a need for commercial kitchen space uh, and also meeting spaces that support food related activities to say nothing of the nearby urban farms and, and supporting and tying into them uh, and then also uh, obviously a grocery store the, the tons of information about North Baton Rouge as a food desert as you as you may um, uh, may surprise. Thank you Chris. This was a quick question for uh, Calvin it referred to the I think this was the graph you showed where the the uh, correlation between the, uh, the, the miles per hour and the number of, or the rate of, uh, was it fatalities? The rate of speed. So the, the posted speed limit on a street directly correlates to the likelihood of a fatality okay. if you're hit by the car. Yep. And the question is, is this per how many people? Is that per 1,000, the, the numbers that you had on the graph? Uh, so this was, if I'm, if I'm understanding the question, this was saying, if any one person is hit by a car, what is the percentage chance that they will die? Got it. And the percentage okay. chance increases based on the posted speed and the speed in which they're hit. Okay. So it was a percentage, not necessarily a, a rate. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, here's, here's another one. Um, this is from Ginger. Uh, she reads, uh, she says, I am currently reading The Color of Law. Is there any movement afoot that we should be supporting to fix the systemic disparities? Oh. Uh, Chris, did you want to jump in on that? I, I definitely have something. I'll follow you. Um, so uh, I don't think anything is is uh, a foot that is uh, that matches the magnitude of the problem. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that mm -hmm. um, we did see in the Obama administration uh, advancements on 
um, uh, addressing the <clears throat> uh, Housing uh, Act, the 68 uh, uh, Civil Rights Act. Uh, it's, it's affirmatively furthering fair housing standards, uh, which um, uh, have long gone uh, unenforced or weakly enforced, depending upon uh, you know, who you talk to. So uh, that kind of you know, got moved, addressed at the end of the Obama administration to be shelved uh, during the last four years. And so um, and depending upon uh, the outcome of the election uh, that is, uh, I'm sure, on, on all of yeah. our minds right now, yeah. uh, uh, we hope that um, uh, if you know if there is a change in administration, the uh, hope would be that the new HUD administration would take seriously those efforts, and that can be, as, as Calvin has mentioned and others, a step towards having more uh, data-centric uh, accountability with regards to understanding if we do have fair housing uh, in areas. That that's one minor piece, right, of of what Rothstein is speaking about, and as I said, uh, does not rise to the level of, of, of the problem. Um, I'll just, uh, maybe I'll quickly say, um, we're hoping to start a movement or yet another movement. Um, and this movement is to say that zoning and land use regulation has been a tool of white supremacy, of racial disparities, whether it's wealth, health, or any other disparity that you can think of for our entire history. And the only thing, way to change that is to change the system. And right now our zoning policy is on a state by state locality basis. And so we need a movement because we're not likely to pass a federal law that, that changes the zoning around the country, but we need to educate, co-power, empower communities and coalitions around the country who can go state by state and change the zoning and land use regulations to promote racial equity rather than actually promote these racial disparities. And one big example of that, where we don't zone for racial equity and we don't zone for economic inclusion is the idea that many places are only zoned for single family housing. That zoning alone in its initial theory was done on a racial base, on a racialized basis. That's just the history of it. It doesn't matter sort of what people are thinking now and the character of my neighborhood. It was designed to keep people of a certain race and in many cases, the intersection of race and class in certain neighborhoods only. The only way to change that is to change our entire land use re regime and single family zoning as a part of it. Because as long as you have, I think California, 70% of the land is zoned for single family. We'll never get our, out of our affordable housing crisis. Everything we do will be on the margins if most of our cities are zoned for single family housing because we need multifamily, triplexes, this idea of the missile, missing middle type of housing. We need all of them. And right now our zoning alone is an immediate barrier to all of that. And, and, and one thing that's important to note with, with what Calvin's talking about, which is you know, central to what Rothstein is talking about in the color of law, is that we, we tend to think that what we see, the shape of, uh, and her character of our cities is somehow a, an, an inevitability of the market, right? Mm. Uh, and it's important to understand that in housing specifically, in the history that Calvin is just referencing, policy shaped the market, right? Policy shaped the lending criteria. Policy shaped the ways in which the federal government subsidized all of this. Policy shaped the ways in which the fears that people had uh, about social mixing, uh, racial mixing, were then codified into housing finance law, zoning law, uh, construction law. I mean everything. So um, it's important to understand that you know we think of these things as oh people just live where they want to live and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, but understanding that if, if, if across a number of different areas of, of policy making, housing is 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 one of the biggest areas where we can see that policy is shaping market outcomes. Uh, and that is still the case. And so it gives us a tremendous opportunity uh, to, 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 to achieve more equitable aims. Yeah, you're, you're spot on, Chris, both Chris and Calvin. And, and I appreciate your, uh, your, your, your uh, candor in, in uh, being willing to, to bring that up. Um, but let's shift gears to, to one that uh, I think Jessica may be able to uh, uh, opine on. And 
and I, I, I have some experience with this one as well, but this is from Elena. In your experience, do planners and public health professionals readily work together and see the connections? If not, what are the best ways to jumpstart those partnerships? Uh, that's, that is a great question. Um, and in my experience, when CPEC started uh, embarking on this endeavor to um, be thinking more about public health and thinking about how to integrate public health concerns into our planning work, um, we reached out to a number of health professionals, uh, whether they were, you know, working for government offices or, or private physicians, working for insurance companies. And what we found is that at the, at the individual level, there was so much, we had all these great conversations with people from the Department of Health and, you know, from, from different doctor's clinics. Um, and, and absolutely, we saw the connections um, and, and the opportunities. What has been more difficult is figuring out how to how to create the institutional pathways for those sorts of partnerships and how to how to institutionalize joint approaches to shared to shared challenges. Um, and I do think uh, that's one of the reasons why we are so excited about our partnership with um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield on on the pilot project that we're doing. Um, I, I think that's a it's a really remarkable thing that a nonprofit planning organization and a a large health insurance company could work together, you, you know, to to solve a shared problem. Um, and I, and and so I point to that as a you know a mark of progress. Something similar I think is also happening with the CDC's funding that is now looking more broadly at social determinants of health and investing in programs that do look at complete streets and community design and connecting those to other, you know, increasing physical activity, improving nutrition, and they're supporting coalitions made up of planners, physicians, the ag extension agents, nutrition experts, uh, researchers, like from Pennington Biomedical. So those the, having a federal funder support that kind of partnership um, and and applying it to communities that have need uh, that is that's so ideal. I would love I would love to see more of that. And then it's a great it's the best way to leverage the enthusiasm that we have on the individual level for working together. So I've been given the the, the hook here that uh, <laughs> we're we're uh, approaching the end of this this question Q and A session, but. Let, let me just give the city of Baton Rouge a plug because uh, Baton Rouge is one of the few markets that I know of across the country that has come together where the health providers have hospital systems have come together and jointly do their own commu the, their community needs assessment uh, all together. And uh, as a result of that, they've created a very robust uh, uh, group of uh, leaders who are focused on identifying and addressing those needs and have really done an excellent job of uh, uh, tackling the, the, the challenges that have come as come about as a result of that, uh, um, that needs assessment. So uh, kudos to the city and, and to the leadership for, for doing that. Um, what can I say? This, this, is, this is a very good panel and I've been uh, just real uh, delighted to, to uh, serve as your moderator today. To our speakers, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and for your expertise and for freely offering your, your insight on, on this, uh, this topic. Um, so uh, to close out, let me just again, thank you our, to our speakers, sponsors, and especially those attendees. Uh, we want you to know that the summit would not be possible without the support of CPEX members and if you would like to help support CPEX in providing this educational content year after year, visit CPEX.org and click become a member. If you are an attorney or a certified uh, floodplain manager, please fill out the survey that will appear when you close the Zoom uh, window so that you can help, so that we can help you get uh, continuing education credit. 
And please, everyone, don't forget to mark your calendars for the next session of CPEX's Smart Growth Summit. On November 18th, we have green infrastructure in the Delta, which will explore the exciting green infrastructure work occurring in New Orleans, including these dynamic expert speakers, Aaron Chang, Blake Crow, and Jessica Dandridge. James Logan will moderate. Their conversation will touch on the critical importance of building trust through intentional com community engagement, achieving a critical mass for support and recognizing a few hard truths. Again, we hope to see you on November 18th and thank you for joining us today.